Okay, I'm going to post um, this thesis that uh, written by a lady named Shannon. Maybe it's a male, actually, I don't know. Could, could Shannon be a male? Um, I don't know. Shannon Warnick. Um, she wrote a, a an incredibly well researched and um, detailed thesis called um, "The Reluctant Colonization of the Falkland Islands, 1833-1851." A study of British imperialism in the Southwest Atlantic, and um, I find it amazingly insightful. And um, I wanted to preface it with a little video introduction that just occurred to me as I was realizing um, this anecdote that I can make as an introduction. The, um, you know, the, 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 the story of the, of the Falkland Malvinas Islands dispute reminds me a lot of, uh, makes me think a lot of, um, of something that happened with my aunt, my brother, my, my father's sister, her family, and the house that um, our our grandparents, their parents built in Mar del Plata, and what happened there. It's kind of interesting. It's it's a a very interesting parallel. And uh, I guess you, you you should draw your own conclusions. I'll try to quickly as briefly as I can tell you the story of that of what happened there. Uh, my grandparents uh, built this little house in, uh, in, a, in a neighborhood in Mar del Plata called La Perla and had three kids. My father, his brother, and the youngest, no, the, no, yeah, the youngest, Monona, Yvonne, Yvonne, and she took later, she took uh, her husband's last name, De Pablo. Um, you know, and uh, when I last spent time with my dad, um, I went to spend some time with him, and I really had never thought about it, never, I guess, in the back of my mind, I knew it, but my father only had two boys, uh, me and my half-brother, but my half-brother would not be really interested in anything that had to do with inheritance. Uh, he grew up with his own family and his own family. And then there was uh, my uh, my uncle who died, who was the first one to die. And his son um, also died, my cousin. And, uh, you know, there's there was this little house that uh, where my grandmother spent her last years. And then my dad went to retire, he went back to Argentina to retire and first moved in with his mom and for a little while uh, before she died. And I wasn't really aware of what was going on because I was either in Europe or in Hawaii or the States or somewhere, but I later pieced everything together as I caught up with my dad years later. I went to live with him and my his sister, my aunt, who has three kids, um, did very well for herself. She was kind of the uh, the the good the good the good sheep of the family. She had all all her kids went to college and they all you know worked and 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 were successful. And they she herself uh, ran a little mall in a. Resort beach near Mar del Plata, out in a city about an hour away, on the beach, and uh, they really uh, they fought, I guess, with my dad uh, a little bit uh, while I wasn't there. I mean, I went to stay with my dad and found out that he wasn't really speaking to his sister anymore, and uh, 
I only stayed three years and I knew about this house, but I kind of knew that if the house, the house was in the back and there were a couple little apartments built in the front and um, they, um, I, 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 I left and I came back three years later uh, quickly to see my dad again because he was ill. And I was going to Europe, but I wanted to see him before because I could tell that he didn't have much longer. And I flew down to South America before going to Europe. And, uh, you know, when I was there, a completely different situation appeared. I realized my dad was uh, not being taken care of and he was really in bad shape. Uh, unsanitary, unhealthy, nobody, everybody was just stepping all over using his stuff and um, stepping all over his stuff and he didn't, he wasn't, he had had a couple of heart attacks and at that moment I felt the calling, I needed to stay, change my plans and stay with my father and so I started thinking of everything differently, I was only going to stay a couple of weeks with him just to st spend some time with him. And I realized at that point that he needed somebody to be with him. And I saw that and I, I didn't realize it. I, I didn't think that was the case before. I thought he was being taken care of by some friends, but it was a pretty bad situation. He wasn't being taken care of, he was being used. And, um, and so I, and I then thought, oh, well, the house, I'm supposed to inherit this house, this little house maybe share it with my cousins. I figured uh, I would be one third of, of the division because there were three kids, three siblings, and there was a sister, uh, there was a, uh, a, a female cousin left from the brother that died, uh, still alive. Her brother had died, my cousin had died. And then there were the three kids of, Mona, of Yvonne that, uh, they were not in live, you know. They one was successful, and she had her own thing, family, and everything in this beach resort city. And then um, the others, the son, my cousin, was the her her boy was in Buenos Aires and was doing really well too. And her daughter, my uh, other cousin, was living in Canaries. And um, I thought, well, you know, I can do something with this house. I can turn it into something. I can. Um, uh, make it into a lot. They, they, uh, they were building um, a um, they were just about to build a new hub a train station long distance bus hub only a few blocks away and when that happens in a small city that neighborhood usually gets transformed and becomes very busy with hotels and stuff and I thought, oh, this, I have an idea, you know, we should make this into a hostel, a, a student hostel. And I told my dad, you know, I'll stay. And he said, well, you know, the, I sold your inheritance already. And I go, what? To who? Why? Well, because I kind of used part of it to pay for your ticket. And I, I don't want to really, he didn't really want to leave me anything. He, he just, he just didn't, he wasn't thinking that way towards me. Um, my parents just didn't really care about the, their kids' future and, but at that moment I had a conversation with him and he kind of agreed with me and said, okay, if that's what you want, you know, go talk to the guy. He had practically given it away, my, my, my portion. He had practically given it away very cheaply to one of the renters in the property. And um, I went and spoke to him. I said, hey, you know, I'm going to stake. I want to buy back the part and do some, make something with this little house. And, and plus, you know, I studied architecture and I was really excited about it. I had all these ideas and, you, and, and then I have an issue with having home. You know, it's always been an issue for me. I, I really need to feel my home and fix it and plan to make a garden and plan for the future. And so I have this whole thing. So I was very passionate, very motivated about it. Um, and he said, okay, fine. But at the same time, the people that were taking care of my dad um, were about to, they were getting, 
they were getting figured out by me. They, I was starting to see what they had done and they were trying to um, keep the paperwork, all the documents that said my dad's, that, you know, that proved my dad's uh, part of the house. They were trying to keep it or they were doing something. They were hiding paperwork and they were lying to me and, and they had not been taking care of my dad. They were over medicating him and I was thinking I was going to be able to take that situation out of their hands, but instead they started warring me and fighting and lying and trying to convince my father to not believe me to uh, and, and try to fill his head, as they say. Uh, and so my dad, and, and he wasn't, you know, he could hardly speak very coherently and or he was very slow. He had slowed down a lot. He couldn't really, you know, I, I didn't have the heart to pressure my dad because he was already uh, into, you know, to thinking and to having a heated argument about this. So they, things happened. The police came one time because they lied and they locked me out of the house and whatever. And so I, I had to abandon that situation. It was a real sad story and I wasn't able to stay and take care of my father. Although he had said, sure, you know, if you, you, you're just going to have to do all the legwork and you get, you know, buy, give back the $700 some, or $7,000, something ridiculous that he had sold my part, my inheritance to his renter, get it back. And I was going to do all that, but I needed help and I couldn't get anybody to help me in, in this city. It was a very bizarre moment and I ended up going back to Europe. Anyways, years passed and I, I uh, stayed in Europe for three years and I went to Hawaii for three years and about you know, six years passed and I found myself being able to uh, go to Argentina again. I thought I wasn't sure if I was going to stay or, or maybe, uh, you know, I was going to try to stay. But in any case, I ended up showing up in Mar del Plata again. And, you know, I, I heard that I, I wasn't, I didn't know what had happened. While I was there that time before I left, I had talked to my aunt on the phone, his sister, the one that he wasn't talking to anymore and said, Hey, it's me. You know, we haven't, we hadn't seen each other since I was a kid. Uh, and I always, I always liked her. I kind of, I thought she was funny and smart and sharp and sarcastic. She had a kind of a, a, a funny sense of humor, kind of like my grandmother, uh, sar you know, sarcasm. Um, in, in the way she, 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 she went about dealing with people and her remarks. And I had this memory of her and I always thought that we had some, some good chemistry, but we just never cultivated an anti, uh, nephew relationship. So this phone call in this phone call, I said, Hey, you know, I was excited. Like to me, she had always, I always saw her as a friend and I said, you know, I can do this. I can, I can, uh, turn this into a hotel and then we'll leave it to the, to the grandchildren, to the kids of, of, of her, of her, of her children, my, my nephews and nieces. Um, so I had this whole idea, you know, we'll leave them a hotel, a hostel, international hostel, you know, and they'll be able to share it. All the, all the grandchildren, all her grandchildren, her kids, kids. And also my other cousin, my, that was in Mar del Plata, um, Virginia, um, was uh, also had two daughters. And so, you know, it would all, all, all be left for the next generation. And I thought it was a great idea and I could um, um, vent my, 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 pen, my pinned up necessity to design something, finally a building. And so I was really excited and she kind of said, you know, your father never paid taxes and, you know, you think it's so easy and, you know, we're, we're, we just want to get rid of that house. We just, we just want it all to go away. I don't, I don't want to see your dad or anything. And she just kind of shut the door on me. And then the, uh, all the, the problem happened with these people that were taking care of my trying, using, exploiting my father. Uh, we started fighting and I ended up going to Europe. Okay, so I spent three years in Europe and then three years in Hawaii. And when I show up in Argentina again, I was kind of curious to know what had happened with this house. Uh, I wasn't expecting to get it anymore, to get my portion or anything, but I wanted to 
wanted to know what had happened. And uh, I walked by one day and I looked at it and it had been all painted and, you know, painted. Nothing, they hadn't built anything, but you could tell somebody new owned it. And, uh, well, I stayed in Marta Plata, things didn't go so well, and I ended up in uh, my cousin Arlene's house. She was helping me out because I, I, I ended up not having a place to live anymore and I was just going to come back to Europe. But that last month and a half, I had nowhere to live, so she picked me off the street practically and took me to her house in Villa Hesel, in this uh, resort beach city near Mar del Plata where she lived. And my auntie lived there and also in Mar del Plata, and I, I saw her for the first time because that last time I hadn't seen her. I spoke to her on the phone, but I hadn't seen her. And, um, you know, and I spent what I thought was a really cool time with them because I had always, you know, I was a, I was a kid when I was growing up in Mar del Plata uh, and I, I wasn't born in Argentina, but I went to do my elementary school there. And so they were like that family. My parents had never made a family. They were always having us be taken care of by other situations in other places, by other people. And so I have this thing about needing family and home and, um, and so I was really, in my mind, I thought, well, maybe I can stay in Villa Hesel and get a job here. And they will, my, it's, it's my family, you know, I'll have family and they'll introduce me to, I'll start a life. They'll introduce me to their friends. And I was really innocently happy about staying with them, but I, I kind of hadn't proposed it to my cousin who I'm, whom I was staying with. She, I told her that I had a return ticket to Europe to not worry. I wasn't going to be a burden. I would be out of there. You know, I just needed to wait until as, as much as I could and kind of enjoy my stay. And she said, okay, you can stay in this house that I'm right now I'm painting. So nobody's living there. And I stayed with them two months and we'd get together all the time. Um, for, for lunch. And for me, it was sweet because I was for the first time hanging out like family with my auntie and uh and my cousin and they had dogs and i was i love Villa Hesel. it's all built in sand dunes and and so you walk the streets is what is uh, like walking in on the sand dunes it's wonderful this this beach resort and uh you know but i kind of wanted to know um what happened with uh, what you know how did dad what was his demise like, you know, who ended up taking care of him? Because I knew he had died only, uh, only like 10 months after I got to Europe that time. And my mother also had died like three months after I got to Europe and six or 10 months later, my dad died in Mar del Plata. And I found out and I really didn't know anything because nobody had, I didn't have anybody I was talking to when I was living in Europe. I was trying to work and, and get my life together here and all I knew it was kind of really sad I only heard somebody wrote actually it wasn't even hearing they told me in a written form uh, both things that first mom and then dad had passed away and um, so I was left there was this whole story that I needed to know where I wanted you know I had ideas I wanted to go see him at the cemetery at the cemetery and and um, I had lots of questions and so, but I started sensing that they were skirting around. They really didn't want to tell me what had happened. You know, we talked about this lady, the lady that was exploiting, that was trying to pass for a friend and was actually using him and taking his money and they were taking care of him and letting him die practically in bad hygiene and a terrible hygienic uh, situation hygienically terrible situation and uh, which is why I had thought I wanted I, I knew I needed to stay and I wasn't able to and so I needed to know what had happened and so she told me some you know how this woman tried to swindle them from the house and try to she had to and then she just tells me you know we had to buy it all back and um, you know I was oh really you bought the part that, in other words, she bought my part from the neighbor that my dad had sold it to, 
have almost given it away to, so that she could put all the parts together and then bought Virginia's part, bought Virginia's part, part so that she could put it all together and then sell the whole house. And, um, you know, I was at that moment, emotionally, I kept thinking, well, I, I feel that I, there's something I, not that I'm owed, but in my, emotionally, I felt that um, maybe they would have or should have said to me something like, well, we didn't think that you were coming back, but since you're here, this is your fair share. Now, maybe that's expecting too much. And some families would do that. You know, some families would, you know, in, in the person's absence, they would, even if they're a cousin, they're not, they're not really very close to, but some families will do the right thing this way, correct? But um, they didn't feel that way. They felt you weren't here. Your dad didn't even want to give you the, the, your part. He sold it, and I said, well, well, yeah, but you don't know what we talked about when I, while I was there. He, he changed his mind. He let me, uh, you know, go about recuperating it. So, but you weren't there. I mean, that's something I know, and I'm telling you now that that's what happened. And, and so she just, they just kind of, both my cousin, who I thought was on my side, my friend, or what, you know, they both had this attitude, especially my cousin, there was something like she, there was an area that she did not want to touch. And this is what it was, is that I guess in their, in their conscience, they kind of knew that I would, I would be, of course they knew that I'm sure they went to lawyers and the lawyer asked, well, who does he have any sons? Uh, does, you know, maybe there was a signature required, who knows? Um, the way that my dad sold my part to this renter was also kind of, um, kind of bogus. You know how they had to probably do some correcting in order to be able to put together all the parts and sell it. And so I know that they thought and talked about me at some point somewhere and they had an attitude or they dismissed it as, well, he's not here. We'll just proceed. We'll just go forward. But now I was there sitting at the lunch table, at the dinner table with them. And it was a little uncomfortable. And so, you know, the question, the, the, I guess the, the, the moral of the situation is technically, legally, I, they proceeded according to a structure of law and, and self-serving interest that, uh, technically didn't do anything wrong. They didn't actually steal money from me or anything like that. Although morally, you could say, you know, law is built on morality uh, and values before the, the written word of the law, these values and th this morality exists, and then we build law around it. And that's why there is law where you uh, inherit something. And even if there is nobody around or nothing signed or no will. There are laws in the state where there's a default, right? Where property goes to the kids. And then the, they also added laws for um, being able to s sell. Uh, I don't know what the term is for when the, the inheritor is still alive. You could still sell their part while you're still living. In other words, there's laws in America and, this, and Argentina that I know of to the effect of uh, the son, or the, the, the one who built the house or who inherited the house from their parents, like the case of my dad and her and my aunt, could sell the part that goes to their kids, me and my cousins, while they're still alive. And there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of a contradiction or polemics, or how do you say this? controversy in the law because there's a one level of law that you know they they kind of uh, oppose each other you could fight you could fight it in court you know there's it's one of these areas of 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 the law that kind of has two different uh 
structures, two different uh, systems of in, in inheritance. And so people have, for example, recuperated what ought to have been theirs, for example. Um, and I suppose I could have tried something like that. I don't know what my chances were, but I really didn't want that. I kind of looked at my aunt and my uh, cousin to just kind of have a little bit of heart towards me because really in my, and, and maybe say, well, you know, here's some money or we'll help you stay in Argentina. We'll, we'll put you up somewhere so you can stay, so you can have, you know, the equivalent of, of not uh, a youth hostel, <laughs> international youth hostel, but since your heart is about coming back to Argentina and living here, and we understand that, you know, and this happened and we're sorry. And so here, we're going to help you this other way or something, you know, and I kept kind of waiting for that to happen. And they weren't <laughs> going there. They were just avoiding the whole thing, waiting for me to leave because my, my cousin knew that I was, I had a date for my return ticket to Italy. And um, so they just, they were just shutting up about the matter and waiting for me to be out of their lives again. And um, so it's really interesting because, you know, technically my dad could have sold my part in, a, in an open, not in a strange way where nobody knew what anybody was doing. And then he kind of signed a little piece of paper with his tenant. And, but, you know, there is a bit of, there is a, an area of law structure where he could have been, you know, said to me openly, you're, you know, I don't want you to, I'm going to sell this, you know, con. but this happened while he was ill and he wasn't thinking right. And they probably convinced him to do that. I know they did actually convince him, this lady that she probably got something from it, from, from him doing that, from him selling my part to the neighbor, to the, um, the tenant in the, on the property. And so there's a whole medical aspect that he wasn't really, this wasn't done in a way that I got to say, well, you know, it, it was all done openly and uh, strictly by legal codes. No, there was, and even if it were, there's always the moral question of, am I, am I wrong in expecting that my aunt, now the thing is my aunt and her cousins, they were not really, we didn't grow up together. We didn't get together ever. You know, the time that I was living in Mar del Plata, they had their own life. They never came to see my sister and me. So, and they, uh, on top of that, they're very sort of, it's only about us. They're the kind of tight, you know, three kids, the parents and uh, a very closed family. They, they weren't about, you know, spending Christmas and New Year's and birthday parties with all the, the, the extended family. That was not them. They're very uh, money oriented. Well, you know, success, money achievement oriented, working, private people, uh, kind of hard, hard that way. You know, I don't want to say selfish, but really money oriented. <laughs> and, um, you know, so there is this situation where the dichotomy is that in my mind, I was hoping that they would do what was right. They would, uh, you know, go by what does not require law. What we know is felt by the, 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 the values and the principles of the heart uh, that just feels right. And so if it wasn't returning, the house was gone already, and if it wasn't too, if it was too much money to give me or to give me even a fraction of, or if they didn't like the idea of money, it would result in them saying, well, you know, we're sorry. We didn't realize we were doing it to here. Here's something so that, you know, that kind of uh, normalcy was trampled on completely uh, because of consciousness, con not guilt necessarily, but uh, yeah, you could say guilt to make it simple. There was, there were, they just wanted to avoid what they perhaps in their heart knew was wrong. They, they knew they had wronged me, but they had the law to grab onto and justify their actions. They, they could say, well, 
we don't have to think about that. We don't have to explain anything because we did everything according to the book. So they had the, the, they had the, 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 uh, the ability to keep quiet and proceed as if nothing was done wrong, but something was done wrong. And so it's, it's sort of an emotional play between, it's, it's sort of a play between what the law allows us to not feel and what we still regardless will feel. <laughs> uh, it's just uh, something that happens in this world, right? And so it's amazing, but there is the, uh, the Malvinas Falklands conflict is very much about this. Um, if, if, you know, the, the British can't say that, you know, they had a city going on there and they had a harbor and they had, no, they kind of like, it was utilitarian. It, it wasn't something that, uh, that, that stoked at their hearts saying, how dare you? That was, that's our land. That's our people. No, there was, they had left it actually. They had vacated, uh, the islands. And so, but the Argentinians weren't looking at it that way. They were small and they could barely reach, but they knew that that, those islands were left by the Spanish for no other country that was around other than them and maybe Uruguay. If anything, they should have shared it with, uh, shared them with Uruguay. Um, but they were barely able to manage what their, the, the start of their independence and they really needed Britain and everything. A lot of stuff that is said in this uh, thesis that is explained in a part of it. I haven't read all of it, actually. I just wanted, I had the idea for this introduction and I haven't finished reading it, actually. Um, <clears throat> but this story with my uh, aunt and my cousin is amazing. It, it is the same situation uh, in, in, the, in the full description of what the world is about and what we could do if we wanted to do right by people, but what we choose to not do because we can get away with it, because we have an army, because we're super rich and they need us. And so we can, we can just say, no, we're not going to respect you. We're not going to look at the heart of the situation. Uh, we can actually say that this, this is about the the rights of self-determination of the islanders. And the islanders are basically there not because they wanted to build a country. <laughs> the islanders didn't, they're not pioneers that, 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 that went to, they, 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 they wanted to start building a home because by now, after, a hundred, after 200 years, they would have a country with embassies <laughs> and, and schools and a little university. And no, there is still a colony practically. And so, the whole justification that the United States as well does this with the islands in the Pacific, it, you know, if they were to be contested by another country, they could say, well, let's ask the people. Of course, they already know what the people, uh, the British know what the people in Gibraltar are going to say, for example. And so this whole setup of a uh, overseas territory with um, that, they don't have to argue and contest against the Spanish or against the Argentinians because they are wise enough to understand that the human heart wants to be comfortable, safer. They want to be with the rich ones. They want to be with the one. If Britain was, you know, I don't know, Yemen or a chaotic country, Syria or El Salvador or Guatemala or, or some place that really nobody has much admiration for in the world, sadly, sad to say, but uh, you know, they would, they couldn't do that. They couldn't say, well, let's ask the Gibraltarians if they want to stay with us, you know, <laughs> because they risk the Gibraltarians saying, well, is there something better? <laughs> but, you know, of course the Falklanders are not going to say that. And the, uh, the people on the Falklands or the Malvinas, the people on the Malvinas, are not going to say that. The people in Gibraltar are not going to say that. Because it's Britain, and they have they're the, the strongest military, most capable uh, among the most capable military powers in the world. Um, so, and they're rich, and they're uh, uh, they're uh, what do you call it? An offshore haven? What do you call it? Haven paradise? Something financial money laundering? Whatever. 
you know, they're, I don't think they have any homeless people begging. I don't think they have a problem like that in Gibraltar. So it's all about the money, right? And so was my aunt, uh, all about the money, all about, she's an investor. She has real, uh, uh, real estate. You know, they they have houses in other cities in Argentina and and uh, they invest and they build. That's what she likes to do. And she likes to hire an architect to fix the apartments that she buys. Um, so it's, it's, it's like my aunt and her family is Britain, you know, and I'm Argentina. That's kind of like what the, what the analogy is. It's uh, amazing. Amazing. I never thought, I never thought of it until I read um, Shannon Warnick's uh, thesis. And as I was reading it, it was like, wow, this, I get what happened. I see what happened. Um, anyways, okay, so I hope you you enjoy this. Uh, it's a lot of reading. I'm not used to it, but maybe somebody, you guys are used to reading a lot and quickly. I have a hard time reading a lot, but I'm enjoying it a lot. So, so long. Thanks for listening.